it's recording. All right, Gabe, where are we starting at, my friend? All right. Well, welcome, guys. Whoever is live, whoever's watching the recording here later, we have a really, I, I think, interesting discussion and topic today. Um, we have the topic of cultivating culture with a mixed staff of full time and part time. So for us here at NC Fit, and this is kind of the first thing that I'm going to hand off to Jason in a second, you know, we've had a long history of part-time coaches, full-time coaches, a mix of both. And I think we've learned a lot of lessons along the way, you know, and one thing that, you know, MBV especially is super passionate about that we want to kind of tie in to this idea of having full-time and part-time staff is building a culture and building a culture that's unified and has the same kind of amount of buy-in and everyone headed in the same direction, whether they're committing 40 hours of their week to the business or they're committing you know, anywhere from five to 10 hours of the week to the business. And I think that that could be challenging because naturally if you have someone that you know, is coaching at NC Fit a few classes a week, but also has a full-time job that is very important to them over here, that is a much different circumstance to be in than someone that is coaching Full time for the team. So, kind of how you keep all of that unified is definitely a challenge, something that we've had to deal with at our business. And I'm hoping that this conversation helps you guys in case you're dealing with the same issues or if you're currently using mostly or all part time staff and thinking about bringing on someone that's full time. So, I think to kick it off, Jay, you know, I, I, I'd be super interested if you can give us like a high level of how the business has evolved in the type of coaching staff that we have and kind of where we're at now. Yeah, it's a really good good um, starting point. So first off, thank you for everybody joining us. Thank you for everybody listening in the future. You know, it's a, it's a really important topic, but Gabe, MDV, everyone here at NC Fit, we're highly invested into professionalizing the industry of fitness. And we wanna have these type of discussions because they're the way that our industry continues to evolve. When we opened the gym in 2008, very similar to most of you. It was me coaching all the classes. It was, it, was, it was doing all of it. Now, those things have changed, right? Back in 08, you're able to get away with certain things. Now the industry's kind of evolved and you might need to have partners or hire people from the get-go. But for us, our story is very simple. It started off as one. Then it went from one to hiring a part-time coach who helped support some of those hours because it freed me up to go do additional things for the gym. And so the easiest thing to delegate out first was to find a part-time coach. And that part-time coach ended up going to chiropractic school at the same time. So it was a perfect blend for me where they had this education, they were in school, they were prioritizing that, but they were also able to prioritize the gym because outside of school hours, they had other hours available. In the beginning, we started off as part-time. Then what I started to realize was that if we wanted people invested into our business, it couldn't be transactional. It couldn't just be like, come in, coach every now and then, and then leave. Because when I would need help or I would need support, they had other obligations. When you ask them, hey, who do you work for? What do you do? They'd say, oh, I work for you know, Nike and I'm part-time coach at NC Fit. And so it became a conflict because as the business had more needs and I had more desire to go grow it, I didn't have anybody who actually said like, yes, like I'm on the, I'm on the team. So then we started saying, you know what? Everybody needs to be full-time. That was the position. It was like this part-time thing. It doesn't work. They're not engaged, et cetera. We're going to bring everybody on full-time. And what I learned the hard way was that it is difficult to provide full-time salaries and full-time hours if they are only coaching. And so what ended up happening was I would be paying premium salaries because they needed to make enough money to live off of because we were their sole source of income. But yet I wasn't able to back that up with enough hours of coaching. And so I ended up just paying for hours that weren't really adding value to the business. So then what happened was this kind of evolution where we have some people that are full-time, some people that are part-time and looking more at people who are bought in on the vision, regardless of whether or not they're full-time or part-time is how we've kind of evolved. So I went from thinking part-time was the way to go to then thinking, no, 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 only full-time to then realizing that a beautiful blend is actually the best solution. Um, sorry to go long winded, but that was kind of like the evolution. No, I think that that was a really good overview. And I think to give us a little bit more background for this conversation, it'd be useful MDV, if you can give us a little bit of the nuts and bolts of what is the difference currently between what a full time coach for NC fit is doing versus a part time coach. Is it just the hours on the floor or is there something else that goes into those, those scopes? 
Yeah. I, um, so before we get into that, I just think that the evolution of your business or the current state of your business really matters. And, you know, you might be at a different state of your business, or you might have a single location, or you might have a smaller community or a smaller space, and you might not necessarily need full-time people or multiple full-time people. And I do believe that culture is agnostic of whether or not your staff is comprised of full-timers, part-timers, or the blend of the two. For us at NC Fit, the best way that we have found to get the job done for all the different things that we have to do and to run an optimal business operation and to give the level of service to not only our brick and mortar locations, but what we do through the NC Fit Collective, what we do on the NC Fit app and a bunch of the other stuff that we do, including, including corporate wellness, is to have a, like Jason said, a beautiful blend of full-time and part-time people. And we'll get into how we establish culture regardless of what that blend looks like. But in terms of just the roles at NC Fit, if we're talking about our coaches in the Bay Area, we have multiple locations in the Bay Area. In those locations, generally the staff makeup is pretty much the same. We have part-time coaches that hold anywhere from a minimum of about six hours per week to a maximum of about 20 to 25 hours per week coaching. And it depends based on the individual and their level of commitment and what they are looking to earn and how much time they're able to give the business where they fall in that matrix. They have opportunities to earn other additional income through personal training and then other opportunities that we have for them in our business, like authoring briefs or testing workouts or being a part of the filming team. But we also, within each one of those gyms, have a full-time or a person who is earning all of their income through NC Fit, and that person is that facility's head coach. That head coach is responsible for all of the other coaches on their staff. They coach a certain number of hours, but they also have hours that are dedicated to development. Those individuals are almost all, all of them are included in the programming and the development side of the business in which they are writing briefs and testing workouts for us and involved in meetings about those types of things. And that's our general staff makeup within our coaching staff in each one of the gyms. In the Bay Area, we also have one coaching director and we're about to promote another coaching director into a role as well. Frankie Russo is our coaching director in the Bay Area. He coaches a certain amount of hours. It's a little smaller on the schedule for him. I think he's somewhere between like 10 and 12 hours a week right now, but he's available to cover classes if somebody part-time goes out. He takes a lot of responsibility for things on the coaching development side. He liaisons with me with building all of those different tools and resources that we're going to give to our coaches. He also plays a role, obviously, in our briefs and our programming and, and side of the business there. And the other individual who we're looking to promote, Emily, is going to take a little bit more of a role in programming development. And then eventually we'll split that role into kind of working hand in hand to be the coaching directors of NC Fit as a whole. Gabe, if I could just add in real quick, um, I do think one note that's important for everybody listening is that for us, when we think about full time, we're thinking about people that make their income from NC Fit. That's pretty much their sole source of income. And when we break it down to a 40 hour work week and MDV can correct me if I'm wrong here, but for the most part, we split it into three different categories coaching hours, front desk or administrative support, and then briefing on our NC Fit Collective, which is our, our digital product. Is that is that a good way to describe it, MDV? Yeah, um, Matt Walker, who's our president and our, our operations manager would have the most definitive answer there, but the threshold for us for full-time, I believe is 30 hours per week. And then they can work up to 40 hours per week. However, we do want to give them some wiggle room to do private training and all the other things that they would add to the additional income that they would take in. So, so I think the reason why this is an important conversation is that for some gym, gym owners out there who don't have the NC Fit Collective, right? Um, and don't have a digital product, this is where I found difficulty is because when we were trying to make people full-time, let's just say it's 30 hours a week, coaching 30 hours a week is, is a pretty high demand, as many of you know. And so for us, if we could identify a way to have additional scope for those employees, whether it's, you know, following up with new leads, administrative front desk, open gym hours, whatever it may be, those are additional ways to make part-timers kind of build into full-timers, which they also then unlock 
health benefits and things of that nature, which for a lot of people in our industry is very important. So those for, for very few, I don't even think any of them, I don't think we have anybody who's full-time who only coaches class. They have additional scope, even if that's front desk or whatnot. Is that correct, MBV? Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice how you're going to compensate or um, you get your employees or people to earn the number of hours that they would need to earn to be fully committed to your business, if that's the goal. And, you know, one of those ways is to have them coach a more modest amount of hours and then develop a personal training system within your business in which they can participate in and they're reliant on that income to then supplement the coaching hours that they have. Because we all know that coaching 30 hours per week, you can do it, we've all done it, but it's not sustainable forever. And I don't think a lot of people wanna do that. So having those next step evolutions, whether or not that means, hey, we have this personal training option that's available, or we have this uh, individual design option that's available that you can work virtually through, or we have other opportunities within our business. Our business is more mature where we have multiple locations. We need oversight managers. We need people who manage the digital operation or the corporate operation. There's many ways to slice and dice to create bigger opportunities if that's a goal for you, but it doesn't always have to be for everybody. So before we move on, I'm, I'm getting the real time back channel from our president, Matt Walker. So just to confirm, yes, the full time commitment is an average of 30 plus hours weekly. And he wanted to clarify that regardless of full time or part time, all our coaches are compensated in three distinct ways, administrative. So that would be like front desk hours, coaching, which is inclusive of anyone that's doing programs, session plans or on the filming team, and then personal training. So those are kind of the three different, you know, payment, you know, at different rates that our coaches will get, regardless of their, if they're full-time and part-time. So I just wanted to clarify that for anyone that had that question. So thank you to Matt. Um, you know, I think that one thing that MDV pointed out when he was, you know, be, before we got into like the specifics of, of full-time, par part-time is the fact that culture is agnostic of that. And I think that that's super important because we can circle back, you know, towards the end of this webinar on, you know, kind of how we feel about where people should try and take their teams. And if there is one version that's better than the other, but setting that aside, what we wanted to talk about today is, is building culture because it's so important, right? It's so important to have a team that's headed in the right direction and understands what the culture of the business is, what the culture of the brand is and kind of amplifies that. So what are some of, and, and MDV, I'll, I'll hand this off to you first. You know, what are some of the things that we've learned both by doing them right or doing them wrong that have helped us, you know, build a strong culture, which, you know, admittedly we haven't always had, right? Like it, it's not like the perfect strong culture happened overnight, you know, it happens over time. So what are some of the lessons we've learned along the way with this mixed team of full-time, part-time? Yeah, well, I think we're still evolving and, you know, our, our business has evolved a lot. I, you know, when Jason first started NorCal CrossFit, like he was saying, he was, the sole owner and operator and, you know, the guy coaching all the classes and had the graffiti on the wall, the culture was different. It wasn't necessarily better or worse. It was just different. And as the business evolved and it became more of like this behemoth kind of games, really centric gym that everybody looked at as being the pinnacle of training in CrossFit at the time, the culture was a little bit different then. Again, not necessarily better or worse. It just fit for the time. And I think as we've evolved into where we are right now as NC Fit and into the future where we want to go, I think the culture right now is fantastic. I also don't think that there was necessarily anything wrong with doing business in another way if that's what you want your business to look and feel like. And I think in terms of like having an understanding of where you're at culturally, you know, you, you do have to look at your team and your business and your goals and you have to have an understanding of like, all right, how do, how do I transmit what I want this to be to those people in the most efficient way? Because it's very different. It's a little different if you're working with part-time staff versus full-time staff. And I think that's really like the meat and potatoes of the staffing discussion when it comes to culture is like, how do you transmit the things that you want to do to all those different people who have a lot of different things going on in their life? But for me, culture essentially comes down to like a, a lifestyle, a gym lifestyle, the way that we do things here. And importantly, why? Why do we do them that way? That for me is the definition of culture. It's the way of life that
that goes on within the walls and then permeates the walls of your gym and your business. Important in that, super important in that, absolutely critical in my opinion, is the fact that the leadership, the people who really fly the flag from the absolute top, the owner, the head coach, the people who are on the floor and then down the ladder from there, those people have to be the living and breathing representation of your culture at all times, at all times. And that's why there's such a burden associated with being a strong leader. It's a position of high responsibility, high stakes. If you step outside of your culture, if you're the person who's saying, hey, listen, this is who we want to be. This is the things we want to do. This is why. But then you're constantly stepping outside of that. Everybody's going to look at you and go, well, this person's fucking bullshit. Why do I want to be a part of this team? They're not following their own rules. They're not a part of their own culture. You're going to constantly be kind of pulling out of that bank that you're trying to put money into so desperately. So the first foremost thing for me, to, uh, for me in terms of culture is number one, having a really strong understanding of who you are, why, why you are that way, why do you want to be that way, and what do you want to be going forward. And your culture can evolve and change, but you should have a, like, a little idea of what your roadmap is going to be. The second most important thing in terms of culture is if you're the leader, if you're the person who's championing this, you have to be living it and breathing it nonstop at all times. And that's exhausting sometimes. Yeah, there's some times when you can go home and sit on your couch and turn it off for a little bit. But in front of your staff, in front of your members, outwardly email communication. I don't know if anybody saw an email that went out on the Facebook group from CrossFit HQ today. That's a step outside of a culture, in my opinion, that you would go, whoa, something happened there in which that's a little bit of a red flag. So, you know, I think that those things are super, super, super important. And even before you implement any sort of like formal core values or mission and vision and goals, maybe you have that stuff in the background in your own head maybe before you put it on the wall, you have to live it and breathe it first. You know, Jay, I'd love to kick it to you here because, you know, I, a lot of this does, you know, fairly or unfairly kind of fall on your shoulders, right? Like you are our leader, like at the top of the NC Pit organization is Jason Kalipa. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes you know, to us as a leadership team, but to you specifically. So I'm sure that through the decade plus of leading the team that has been North Cal CrossFit and NC Fit for so many years, there's got to be some lessons along the way that, you know, hopefully we can share to the people listening. here. Yeah. I mean, I mean, for any owner out there, I actually have a, I do like a short format podcast on um, our channel effort over everything. And what's coming up in the, in the near future is called a uh, life we chose. And it's just a short format podcast about as the owner, as the leader of your company, you chose this, you chose to take this on. And that comes with great responsibility and great upside. You get to see the success of your team, like having great you, other leaders on your team, like Gabe and MDV and others throughout our organization. That's very rewarding, very fulfilling. And for those of you listening who have, who have seen that, that is excellent. It also comes a lot of responsibility where like MDV says, you always have to be on and and it's, it's really interesting the way leadership works because you could work so hard to build a hedge and then you could stumble once and it could pull you back really far. And I'll give you a great example. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. We have mass mandates in California that lasted, in my opinion, way too long. And I was building resentment towards it. But our business still had the requirement to wear masks. And some of you, a lot of you listening probably were in similar situations. And at times I felt like that didn't apply to me. And um, that wasn't right. And I had to call our staff and tell them that like, hey, this is something I've struggled with, but I wasn't a good leader because we're acknowledging that our coaches and our members have to wear it. But yet I'm different in that sense. That was an example of how I worked really hard. And then all of a sudden I stumbled all the way back down and now I have to rebuild that trust. So from a culture perspective, you have to look at it from the inside and say, hey, how am I doing as the leader of this to clearly communicate what our goals are as a business, whether you're part-time or full-time. And that's something I've learned the hard way where just because someone's part-time doesn't mean they're not bought in. It's our responsibility as a team to make them feel just as bought in as a full-time coach. But I used to think, oh, they're never going to be as, as bought in. And I was wrong. I actually have seen part-timers be more bought in than some full-timers it's clearly about sitting down with that team and making them feel the love, making them feel like, hey, we're going somewhere special. 
But unless you know that as a leader, they're never going to know that. And so I think that we have evolved as NorCal CrossFit NC Fit, where we used to be hardcore CrossFit. And then we've evolved and we've now kind of created our own voice where we have roots in CrossFit, but we've evolved into things that we really feel passionately about, like living freely and fully outside the gym and acknowledging that we want to build this, this ecosystem for our members to get in the best shape of their life. But unless we sat down with our team, clearly communicated that on a regular basis and made them feel it, whether part-time or full-time, we're not doing our job. So I think for me, over the last 15 years, if I could have given myself some advice back in the day, I would have said that it doesn't matter if someone's part-time or full-time, they need to feel like they have growth opportunity within your organization, and they need to feel like they're doing something that is meaningful, meaningful work. Because let's face it, people don't get into the fitness space to make a million dollars. People get into the fitness space to make a life-changing experience on our members. But if you aren't making them feel that, and they're th just there to collect a check, you're never going to run a successful business because they're never going to make the amount of money that they can go make somewhere else, maybe doing accounting or whatever, coaching classes. There has to be something else that's gluing them and gives them fulfillment. I would have thought more about that earlier on and acknowledge that and try to uh, foster that better. You know, I, I think Jason's spot on there, you know, and one of the things that he's kind of constantly um, alluding to is, is the right people. And this is why it's so important, in my opinion, to have this knowledge as the leader of who you are and what you want to be, because it's critical that when you're bringing in people into your organization, that they're a fit culturally for you more than they are a fit for just the time slot that you need coached or just the skill set that you want them to have to coach. They have to be the right people for you. And that includes buying into your vision of what you want your business to be, who you are as a fitness organization. But even more of that, the type of person and personality that they have and they're going to bring into your, your business. That's the number one hiring criteria that we have at NC Fit. I don't care how many seminars you've taken or how many years you've coached. We can turn anybody into a great trainer. It just takes studying and time under tension and repetition. But it's very, very hard to change somebody's personality. It's very hard to change somebody's personal culture. And if you're constantly grinding against that, that's going to chip away at the things that you're trying to build within your business. We've made this mistake within our business as well. We've had people on the team who were fantastic, fantastic trainers, fantastic people. And, and they're really, they're good people but they just didn't get down with who we were culturally. And we tried to constantly lay it down to them over and over and over again. But once you hit that wall, once you know that, hey, this is never going to fit, that person will end up being worse for your organization long-term than the difficult conversation of saying, hey, this, this just isn't a good fit anymore. I want you to go be happy and coach somewhere where it works for you and that you fit into the culture and we will find somebody that fits in here. That's super, super critical. Hey, Gabe, I, I just had these two like really tangible items. I, I definitely think we should talk about Slack today. Um, but I also want to just make sure that when we're talking about full-time, part-time and whatnot, by the way, if you guys have questions, please put them in the Q&A box uh, and we'll make sure to get to those ASAP. Um, but I just want to acknowledge the fact that when you're looking at W2 and 1099, make sure that for everybody listening, or watch this in the future, make sure you're doing, you're doing your due diligence with your local state regulations on, we're talking about full-time, part-time based on hours. And that, you know, we're talking about this more holistically from a, from a business perspective, but from an actual micro perspective, you all need to make sure that you're putting your team in the right category, whether they're w 2 or contractors, make sure that you're aware of that. And if you're unaware of what I just said, please go do some uh, research on that because you might be getting yourself into a difficult position if you're placing people who should be employees as contractors. Something to note, please. For sure, super important. You know, before we get to the, the more tangible tools, I, MDB, I wanna, I wanna throw this to you and I think that it's important. You know, we're, we already discussed how important it is to set the expectation of what the culture is from the top, right? Like leaders have to lead, you have to walk the walk. Like if you're not living it, breathing it 24 seven, it's not going to work. But I think that, you know, the, the second piece of that, cause that kind of sets, you know, kind of setting the expectation. 
what are the conversations or even before that, what is identifying someone straying away from the culture look like in a more tangible sense? And then how does that conversation go? Especially when it's like a part-time versus a full-time staff, like, is there a little bit more lenience when it's part-time staff? Um, and, you know, I, I think that one thing that is important to discuss is like, when do you know that someone is not just being bringing in unique points of view to the business, but actually just straying away from the culture and where you want to go, if that makes sense. Yeah, let me, let me try to answer this because the, there is something really important bef before you get to the conversation of someone stepping outside of your culture or stepping outside of the bounds of their job. You have to establish your standards and expectations, and it has to be very, very clear for the people who are coming into your business and then doing the jobs within your business, what the standards are both for their performance of their jobs and for the adherence to the culture. Because if you don't have that, then you're just operating in this kind of weird vacuum where anything goes. And then you have to have these one-off conversations all the time about, well, this happened here and this happened here and this happened here. And then nobody's singing off the same sheet of music. So like we've said, you have to establish it in your own head. You have to live it. Obviously, we've talked about that. But then when you're bringing people into the organization, everything from your job postings and your job descriptions to your standards for performance or your coach performance or your coach manual, all those things need to be memorialized, in my opinion, and transmitted over to those people so that they know and understand what their performance needs to be and then what outside of that performance goes and doesn't go. Because the conversation when you have somebody who has read the job description, understands their duties, has read the coaching manual, understands what they're supposed to do, it has all the tools and the resources that they need, understands where you're at culturally. It's very cut and dry when you sit down with somebody and go, hey, you left early today to go and you know go grocery shopping for yourself instead of finishing out your class to the 60 minute mark and then hanging out to clean up and, and meet with everybody. Why did you do that? Oh, I had to you know, go grocery shopping or whatever. You clearly can see that on the list of expectations and standards that that is outside of that, correct? Correct. Can you rectify this going forward to make sure it doesn't happen again? Yes, I can. Okay, good. We'll watch this over the next 30 days and we'll see if it happens again. That those conversations are, it's very straightforward. There's no like, oh, well, I didn't know that that wasn't a rule kind of stuff. That's why it's so important to have standards and expectations. Even before you get to the fucking, the tools, I get fired up about this. This is my most passionate thing that I do at NC Fit. Before you get to the tools. I can't tell. I can't tell. Yeah. Like if you have a Slack channel that's going out there and you're just constantly like hitting people up with stuff all the time. And they're like, I didn't know that we had to look at Slack or I didn't know that this stuff was part of our job. It's not going to matter at all. So before you get to the formal, the real formal stuff all the way down the road, you have to follow that sequence. You have to have those standards and expectations. If you want your coaches to be responsible to the Slack channel, you have to let them know, hey, we are gonna communicate as a team through Slack. We're not using text messages. We don't use group or company-wide emails anymore. If you have something that needs to be transmitted important, use Slack. If you don't get the answer that you need through Slack, call these people, very clear. Outside of that, no go. So that's why standards and expectations are so important. And I think that answers the question, Gabe, of like when somebody steps outside of the culture, that's how you have the conversation. And if you don't have that in front of you, then it's a much more emotional conversation. And I just wanted to add one, one note on this. Um, I think gate or MDV's points are spot on. Um, there's a little uh, additional note, I think from a managerial perspective, just from like a legal perspective as well, that having the structure of how hours are built up helps with this situation. Like early on, like I was sharing, when we hired our first full-time coach, I'd be like, hey, you know, I'm going to pay you whatever thousand dollars a month, whatever. And we just got to get the job done. That was what, what, what it was. We just got to get the job done. I didn't clearly explain what the job was. I didn't clearly explain how hours should be spent. And so right or wrong, you'd have some people that over went above and beyond your expectations and they were working 80 hours a week and you're fulfilling everything you could think of. There's other people because you didn't clearly explain what the expectation was, they didn't know what success or failure was. So if I could do it all over again, especially the first full-time hire, I'd say, hey, you're responsible for 40 hours a week. It's going to be 20 hours on the floor. It's going to be 10 hours doing this. It's going to be 10 hours doing this. And I want you to break it down this way, this way, this way, but really clear. Uh, many, many years ago, I made the mistake of telling someone 
that their responsibility was to answer the phone. And I made the mistake of saying, hey, anytime the phone rings, answer it, which sounds pretty natural. Like it doesn't sound like that's too much to ask, but we didn't set the expectation. That was from, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five. It was just like, answer the phone. Years later, you know, there was a discrepancy in um, how many hours that person actually worked because I had asked them as the leader to always be on for that phone and I wasn't paying them overtime. So if I can go back in time, I would have had a clear job description that they signed off on that clearly acknowledged this amount of hours of work to do this scope of work. And I know that sounds super formal and that's not the way that all of us started off in the fitness space, but you know, we had to end up, uh, you know, litigating over that particular situation. And I could have re I could have avoided it had I had better expectations in the front, like MDV was referring to. Another thing that, you know, in MDV, you actually brought this up in, in our leadership group Slack channel. Um, and you just brought it up now. And it's this idea of how everything that we put out as an organization should clearly communicate the culture and therefore attract the right person. And the example you shared the other day was a fitness company um, that put out a job description on social media that screamed their culture, right? Like they had uh, Kawabanga, like, you know, their, their, their language was something you wouldn't expect in a job description and something that's a little bit more formal, but that's just because that's who they are, right? And I think that that's going to attract the right person and really just as an example of them showing their culture in every shape of the way. But my question, and I think this, this kind of ties into Stephanie's question, which was in the chat box. Um, I read that through and essentially just comes down to, it is hard to find good coaches and good part-time coaches. So my question to you, MBB, is how do you balance, you know, putting out a job description that is going to almost narrow the net even narrower because you're looking for someone that really aligns with your culture and how do you kind of, you know, balance that with the challenge of it's already hard to find just a body to come in and coach classes. You know, what, what's, what's your suggestion there? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. You know, good people are hard to find that that's, that's not just a quick whip saying um, that's true. Ultimately, I think that the hiring thing, you have to try to control that variable as much as you can. And the few ways that you can do that is number one, you have to try to retain the good people that you have by providing them compensation and fulfillment. And those can be through challenging them at work or giving them new responsibilities or continuously giving them opportunities to make more money or to give them raises. But those two levers have to be being kind of pulled in sequence, not both at the same time all the time, but you have to be thinking about those two things. And Stu Brower, one of our good friends, talks a lot about that. Those are the two things that you have to consider when you're looking at an employee, their compensation and their fulfillment. And it's a little bit different for somebody who's full-time, their, their age, their gender, all those things matter in, or part-time, full-time, and all those things matter in terms of what those levers that you're going to pull for that person. So that's one thing, having that open and honest discussion with people and being aware of what are the actual routes that people take within your business and understanding the life cycle of coaches within your business. Because you might have an opportunity to bring on somebody full-time within your business, but you don't have that next level opportunity for them. That's okay. Maybe they have the opportunity to, to make money through personal training and blah, blah, blah. But there might be people who get into that role who, some, who reach a natural life cycle where they go, I need to look for something else. It's much more productive to have an honest conversation with that person be like, hey, what we found is that like two to three years in this role is about the average amount of time and then at that point, maybe we can sit down and have a discussion. Maybe the business has evolved and we're in a different place than we were, or it might be an opportunity for you to go and take your talents elsewhere. But at least having that understanding for you, you can be like, oh, wow, this person's been in the role for a year and a half. I probably have to start thinking about or talking to them about where they're at. And hopefully you don't wait, wait a year and a half to talk to your employees. But having that understanding of knowing the life cycle is really, really critical. The other thing is controlling the variable as much as you can internally. And I really am a big believer in this. And at NC Fit, we have an intern program. We haven't always had interns rocketing through the program, but we're re-jump starting that program. We we're going to have two interns moving through it uh, simultaneously right now. And that's really critical because we're trying to develop people internally, people who have an interest, who have buy-in, who are already within our walls. And sometimes that's hard to take somebody who's a member and then transmit them over to a staff member. 
whole nother set of considerations there. But ultimately, I think you can be very successful in that. You have people who have already bought into what you do. They already know the culture. They already love you and they love the gym. They might have other opportunities in which they're already making money or maybe they're you know, uh, the non-primary uh, earner in their household. And you're able to then develop that person into the type of coach that you'd want to have on the floor. So having that going for you is another way to control the variable. But ultimately, yeah, it's, it's really hard sometimes to find good staff if you're just kind of putting out the Facebook ads and the stuff like that to find people. I would caution against just getting whoever you can to cover the classes. You have to sometimes put it on yourself. You know, when I was living in the Bay Area, I would step up and coach classes. I know Jason has stepped up and coached a lot of classes. Right now, we're in a place where we're, we're honestly out there looking for people to come on in who are fit for us culturally. But we're not just waiting for that to happen. We're pushing people through the intern program and we're getting that system going again in order to graduate people and then keep them internally. Yeah, hire slow, fire fast is, is definitely something that, you know, there's, there's a lot of truth behind that. Um, so I think, you know, we do have some questions coming in. So just want to give a reminder since we're getting to the 20 minute point and then we'll get to some of the tangible tools that if you have any questions, throw them in the Q&A box. We'll definitely get to those. But we were talking about before we, you know, hit record, before we started here prepping, some of the tangible things that we have done lately to try and help and bring culture together and, and have the team feel unified, whether part-time or full-time. And, you know, Slack came up as, as, an, as an option. I can cover this. You know, Slack is something that we instilled probably, you know, two, three years ago um, with just the smaller kind of HQ team. Um, but now it's something that we've rolled out with everyone in the organization. And I think it's really helped organize communications. And now it's just one of those things that it's, it's kind of part of the SOP of bringing a new person on board, right? Before we wouldn't have hired, say, a front desk staff and automatically they would have been put into a group text thread that the head coach had going on. So that's how those kind of things were kind of missed and it was sloppy. But now that we have a dedicated software platform for in, you know, intra-company communications, as soon as someone gets onboarded, they get added to Slack, they're put in the appropriate channels and just automatically loops them in to the communications that they should be a part of while also, you know, not necessarily looping them into every communication so it's not overwhelming. And I think that one really cool thing about Slack is that, you know, there's the random channel, for example, right? Like there's a place that's also for work-related chatter in that it's only the team that sees it, but it's not for like company updates and stuff like that. Like we post birthdays. I posted the picture of Jason who visited Texas the other day. And I think that it's really important to have a central location like that where people can feel unified, even though some of us aren't in the Bay Area anymore. And there are some Bay Area coaches that coach in one location, not the other, who may never see some of the people that are in that location. So that's been a huge tool for us that's been very helpful. One question that I have for you, MDV, and another thing that I think that gets brought up a lot in terms of keeping culture together is team meetings. What is kind of your opinion on the cadence of getting a team together. I know that in the past, you know, we've had the quarterly coaches summits, which were a really powerful tool for us to get everyone together, have a speaker come in, obviously COVID travel restrictions, all that stuff kind of threw a wrench in having those on a regular basis. But what is your opinion or suggestion on getting the entire team together for a team meeting, um, setting an agenda, so on and so forth? Um, I, so I think team meetings are probably overused just generally. Like if you're, I think weekly team meetings are probably a little too much, just my opinion. I think that monthly team meetings are a good touch base, get everybody together. Uh, if you want people to attend those team meetings, I'm a firm believer that you have to pay them to attend the meeting. That it's, if it's mandatory, you have to pay them. If it's gonna be optional and you um, don't care if everybody shows up or not, then you can't be upset when people don't show up. Um, but just generally, I, I kind of think that, you know, weekly team meetings just end up being kind of just a burden on people's calendars. You know, generally you're dealing with people who have a lot of things going on. They're either coaching a, a pretty full schedule. If they're a full-timer, they got a lot of stuff that they're already doing. Maybe they have a family outside. Maybe they got school outside. They got to do that stuff as well. And if you're a part-timer, 
you know, you probably have other things going on. Maybe you have another job, maybe you got a family, maybe you got other commitments that you have to adhere to and trying to keep something weekly where you're anticipating or expecting everybody to come together at one time is very, very difficult. If you want to run a team meeting, the best way to, that, um, in my opinion, to do it is either uh, monthly or quarterly, and then have it set in the calendar well enough in advance where you set reminders out, where you tell people, hey, this is going to be our mandatory monthly time, mandatory meeting. You're going to get paid to be here. This is part of your job. You have to make time for it. If you can't make time for it, please email me or discuss with me and let me know so that we have uh, clarity over why you're not there. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my opinion on, on team meetings. Jason, anything you wanted to add? No, I mean, I, I'd like to discuss a few of these topics that I'm seeing come up in the chat, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start going through them and um, don't check off any of the Q&As this time because you're going to throw me off. I will not uh, check off any of the q and I, I, I wanted to address the um, Connie, if that's, is that good? Yeah, so Connie has two questions. So I'll, I'll read them both and then I'll, I'll let you answer them, Jay. So A, how to get a coach to buy in when you're rolling out changes that they don't like. I think that's a really big one. And we see it a lot with the collective when gyms bring in a new programming, especially when there's a coach on staff that was previously in charge of programming. So obviously there tends to be a rift there. Um, so why don't you take that one first, Jay? Yeah, so I think, look, it, it starts off with if you have buy-in. So if, if it, we'll, we'll speak on Connie in particular. How do you get coach buy-in to roll out changes? Well, if you're not buy-in, that's, that's problem number one. So if I'll use Slack as an example. Slack was a tool that Gabe, really wanted to champion he did and he championed it hard and it took me many months to come around to because i thought it was terrible and so for anybody who's interested in looking at slack it is terrible until it's amazing so it's it's a very difficult software to understand until you get it and once you get it it's exceptional for for business and i, I would highly recommend it but i wasn't as you know gabe was bought in so then i got bought in but if i wasn't as bought in the team would just it would just fail and we've seen this time and time again. Number one is you have to be steadfast in your conviction that this is what's best for the business moving forward. And you're going to get people who are going to talk about it. And this goes for all kinds of things. But are you listening to the sum of your members or some of your members? And are you listening to some of your staff or the sum of your staff? Meaning you got to go out there and, and, and recognize and, and put a line in the sand and say, hey, we need to roll out this new programming because these guys at the NC Fit Collective have a full team that are doing it the best in the world. And once you make that decision, you need to be really adamant about it because if they see any even small fraction of maybe kind of waffling, they're going to not feel as confident as well. So make sure that before you do anything, make sure you're bought in, clearly communicate with your team the why behind it, and then move forward. Those are the two things I think are really, really important with that. You're bought in and you explain the why. And every time we've done anything from rate increases to you name it, those have been the critical factors. MBV, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think Jason's spot on with those two. If you do have somebody who's currently owning programming within your business and you're like, man, I think we got to make a change. Before you bring that information to the team, it's important that you sit down with that person individually and you let them know hey, this is the reasoning why I'm considering doing this. I want to discuss it with you. Or you can sit them down and say, hey, these are the reasons why we are going to do this. And then this will be the new path forward for you here. You don't want to just spring that on the person who's been doing the programming for you for a long time in the team meeting. And they're like, oh, shit, well, now what do I do? But Jason is spot on. Once you have those discussions, the initial discussions, have the group-wide discussion with people. And also, very, you have to very clearly let them know the expectation is that we go forward and we go out there and we champion all of these workouts like it's our favorite workout. Because if the coach is not bought into any workout, no matter if it's our programming or somebody else's programming at the whiteboard, there's no way the members will. The members take all their cues from the coaches. The coaches take all their cues from you. That's right. Um, Connie's other question, how many hours do you consider part-time? So what we said was 30 hours plus is what we consider full-time. So anything below that is what we consider part-time at NC Fit. And then Jason, I know this one gets you super fired up. 
What about staff that is on trade, what you like to call bro deals versus paid? No, Connie, I will say this from 100% confidence and 100% experience over the last 15 years. Do not do bro deals. Do not do trade outs. They pay you for your service. You pay them for their service. It's the best way to do it. And, and, and really think about it in any way, right? If there's zero skin in the game, zero, how often have people signed up for a free trial from you and not shown up? How often have people gotten something for free and never used at your gym? It's because there's no buy-in. There's no skin in the game. So if a coach is not getting compensated for their hour of work, how serious are they going to take it to show up 15 minutes early, make sure they're uh, in alignment with your brief and expectations, and deliver a premium product? How can you expect a premium product to be delivered in your gym if you're not willing to pay a premium for that time? And if they say, hey, you know, I'm a plumber by trade and I'll make sure I do your plumbing needs. Okay, cool. Well, then why don't I pay you for the coaching hours and then um, and then you pay us or you pay us for um, a gym membership and I'll pay you for your plumbing hours and we'll go back and forth because you're an expert at your field. We're an expert at our field. We, we acknowledge that and want to go ahead and make sure that we pay each other for that service. I've just seen it go so wrong so many times please do not do trade outs because it creates what I call the revolving door program. And this is actually something to, to dive, which I know Gabe doesn't like when I jump ahead, but this is a, a bigger problem where what happens is you'll have a revolving door. You're going to go out there and work really hard to get new leads in your gym. They're going to come into your gym and they're going to have a subpar experience because they're being coached and administered by someone who's not even being paid or, or maybe being paid a fraction of what they're worth because that's what you think they're worth. But the reality is they're probably worth a lot more than that because for every member that comes in, if they were to stay, think about what you could actually pay for those coaches versus someone comes in, has a poor experience, leaves, they're never coming back in again. And so I really think it's important. It's critical. Pay a premium. If they're not living up to that premium, let them go. That's a better way of looking at it than trying to just get by with trade outs. I'd rather pay someone the, what they're worth so that every member that comes in has the best experience possible. MDV, anything you wanted to add to that? Rather, I think Jason's pretty extensive there. Yeah, you know, in terms of um, full time versus part time, and then different ranges of experience, I think we this kind of came up earlier. I didn't answer it. I have the same level of expectation for everybody culturally. Culturally, everybody is supposed to rise to the same standard of this is the effort that we're going to put into the work. This is how we show up. This is how we do the job. We show up prepared. But then you have to put a little bit of like a twist on it in terms of their experience and where they're at in their coaching journey. You can't expect everybody to go out there and coach like the 10 year veteran coach. It just it isn't happen. It doesn't happen that way. Over time, yes, they're going to evolve. They're going to get more technically savvy, but everybody, everybody can go out there and coach with energy, a positive attitude, a smile on their face. Everybody can show up on time. Everybody can show up prepared. All of those things have to happen for everybody. Do I expect every coach to see all the subtle faults that are going on in the class? No. And in fact, I don't necessarily care as much about that if all those other things are being taken care of. Will they get there over time? Yes. So that's how I think about the difference in the standards of, of the expectation. I'll touch on Steve Aragonis, um, your question here. Um, I completely get it. You know, Steve is saying that it, it can definitely be scary to go to that next level, um, you know, and kind of figuring out when you're at the tipping point of having to actually hire on staff. And then he's asking if, you know, did the numbers for us show that we had the budget to hire someone on? You know, I think that one thing we've had success with and that I, you, you know, we usually suggest to gym owners that are kind of in that position where it's like, do I bring front desk? Do I bring another coach? is set the expectation in the beginning and make it a 30 or 90 day probation period with that person. Because in 30 or to 90 days, you should know if what you're investing in that new position is bringing a favorable ROI to the business. And the way that works is if you're taking coaching hours off of your schedule as the owner, that doesn't mean that you're now going to have just more free time. That should mean that you're reinvesting that time into sales, marketing, something else that's going to bring more value to the business than you as the owner operator spending time on the floor. So if in 30, 60, 90 days, you're not seeing a return on you now having those extra hours 
to dedicate to sales and marketing or whatever it is you choose to dedicate it to, then obviously there's something wrong, something broken. And if you set the expectation from the beginning that this was, you know, something you were trying for 30, 60 days, you can, you know, maybe step back. It's not working out, reassess and go from there. So I think it's a good way to really see if that investment is paying off. Jason, is there anything you wanted to add there? I mean, um, so Steve, I've been there. It's a really scary time. It is really scary. Every time we've made big hires that were expensive, it was always scary for me. But I knew that it was the right time when it was keeping me up at night, when I was super worried about it, and when I was spending all my time doing things that weren't adding tremendous value overall for the business. And every time you make a decision to make a big hire, you're never going to be able to afford a good coach if you don't just afford a good coach. Meaning it'll just keep, if you've been in the same cycle, same revenue, same membership base for the last year, there needs to be a time where you need to say, okay, well, what I'm currently doing isn't working because it's not creating sustainability for my lifestyle. Well, my next step is free me up to go add value for our business. Well, the first step would probably be coaching. If you're coaching 30 hours a week as the owner of your business, it's very difficult to go out there and go acquire new members and go work on all the customer service things. Because guess what? Someone calls your gym, 30 seconds later, they're calling another gym. So if you're not answering your phone, if you're not answering your emails in a timely manner, those are really difficult things that are going to hold you back. First step is go hire an amazing coach to free you up to get back to emails in a timely manner. And I guarantee you, you'll see a huge difference in 60, 90 days. If you don't, then make a shift again. It's a scary time. You got to recognize you can't keep doing the same thing you're doing. If it's not working for you today, there needs to be some type of change administered. A question from, from Hector here, and then we'll move to the ones in the actual Q&A box. He has a part-time coach, coaching three to five hours a week, has her own home gym, and kind of works out outside of the gym she's coaching in. And I think the question here, you know, A, specific to this, like, you know, asking, is someone that's working out at their own home gym not a part of the culture because they're not taking class? And I think that leads to the bigger question, which I'm curious to your opinion, MBV, is working out, taking classes at the gym, working out at the gym that you work uh, a prerequisite for someone to kind of be a part of the culture at a gym business? I think it depends on the stage of the business that you're in. Um, You know, where we're at at NC Fit right now, after being hit with COVID for three years, we had a lot of change that happened in our business. We have a lot of different aspects of our business. We have a digital footprint. We have a lot of different ways that the organization has evolved. You know, we come into the Bay Area uh, occasionally now, quarterly, hopefully going forward from there, um, now that travel is a lot easier. But, you know, I was living in the Bay Area for four years, and then I stepped away from living in the Bay Area. But for the people who are directly involved in our coaching product on the floor, for the coaching directors that are in the Bay Area now, for the way that we have evolved our organization, yes, I do think it's important for those people to participate in their fitness in the gym. Uh, you can't mandate it necessarily unless you're going to pay them to do that. But, you know, it's, it's part of the culture at NC fit. We want our coaches to be participating in classes every now and again, certainly our, our, our coaching directors understand that they are hopping into classes all the time. Jason hops into classes all the time. We also have open gym areas in which if I see coaches working out during open gym and they're doing their own thing, I love that. I love that people are just getting after it whenever in the gym or outside. Um, I, I, I don't take a hard stance on this, like, hey, you always have to do all of your fitness in the gym. I think it's healthy for coaches to get outside of the gym and experience other things or to go and have some alone time or work out in their garage every now and again. But I do think it's important that they participate in the fitness journey with the athletes or the athletes see them participating in the fitness journey. And another question that comes up a whole lot is like, what about coaches doing their own programming outside of gym programming. I, my stance on this has changed a little bit as I've kind of gone through the space a little bit more. If somebody has certain goals that they want to kind of really dive into and they they want to really experience the next level of competitiveness within fitness, that's okay. They, They can do that. They can go and they can source their programming elsewhere and they can do auxiliary programs or whatever. As long as they still love and talk about the programming within the gym like it's the absolute best and the members enjoy it and they have fun with it and they can participate in that with them every now and again i have no problem with it but if they're talking down about what's going on within the gym and they're saying 
oh, I only do X, Y, or Z now. That's a whole different story. There is a way to do other types of programs or lifting cycles or whatever that the class might not necessarily doing without it being a distraction. I think that's a good answer there. So Sam's question, so diving into the Q&A box here, how do you manage a part-time coach without micromanaging, providing autonomy, but still holding them to a professional standard? That's a pretty broad question. I think it comes down to the entirety of the discussion today that we talked about. You know, first of all, like we said, knowing who it is, knowing what you want to be, living it, establishing the standards and the expectations. And then within the system that you have, I do believe that coaching development necessarily involves some sort of observation and feedback mechanism. It can look a lot different depending on the stage that you're at in your organization. But even before that, if, if you have questions about how your coaches are preparing for their classes, or you want to establish a standard about how your coaches go out there prepared to coach their classes, using a tool like the NC Fit Collective is fantastic. We, this is our coaching development product that we develop selfishly for ourselves. The expectation is that all of our coaches read the brief, watch the video, and show up to class prepared to coach their class. Do they have to follow the brief meticulously as they go through their class? No, that's not how I want them to use it. More experienced coaches, I want them to use the brief like just loose guardrails. Hey, this is what NC Fit recommended. I'm going to stay within these guidelines. Coaches who are coming on who are very, very new or early in their education journey, it's like crutches for them. I want you to follow this much more closely. This is a tried and true way that will help you develop and help you get through these classes and take some of the pressure off you so you can go out there and be yourself and smile and have a good time. Providing tools and resources is huge. David has a question about anything that we've found successful to kind of help the coaches see and feel that they're making a difference in people's lives. So he's had like a kind of a wins board, a PR board per se, um, that he's always thought is a benefit to the athletes, but also, you know, helps the coaches see that, Hey, you know, athletes are progressing. Is there anything we've done in the commercial gyms that have been specifically successful at that? Um, well, we've certainly shouted out our coaches a lot on social media. We've done a lot of member highlights on social media. And I think that this is one social media has a dark side to it, but this is one of the awesome positive sides of social media, where if you as an organization are shouting out your coaches or shouting out your members or your members and your coaches are participating in that in a positive way, that's a huge way, not only to highlight amazing feats and things that people have accomplished, but also share those stories with hundreds of other people, even if you're a small gym, hundreds of other people, if you're a bigger gym, thousands of people that see what you're doing and why it's so special. Yeah. And to add to that, you know, we've been very fortunate, both from members of the collective and members at our NC Fit Gym, Jason, you shared one recently, that we'll email in from time to time, some really awesome emails, you know, letting us know how amazing the service has been and how it's changed your life, so on and so forth. And we always then take those emails and share it with our team. And that to me is always something that gets me re-fired up about what we do at NC Fit because I love hearing like someone took the time to type out an email to Jason or to the collective inbox and be like, hey, you guys rock. And to share that then with the team, I think is a really good way to do exactly what, what um, you know, they, they were asking there. The only thing I'd add to that is uh, for David, yeah. like if you do member surveys, those are a really good way to show your coaches, hey, look, we have a 90% uh, you know, success rate when it comes to coaching. It's a, it, or when you ask for member testimonials, typically they will address specific coaching, share those with your team, share the members, serve with your team. It's a great way to pump them up. So we are at the hour mark. We're going to keep answering all these questions. If anyone needs to hop off, they only had an hour. We did run over. Just keep in mind that you can watch the recording. Just zoom to the end and you'll be able to watch the answers to these questions. So Andre has a question about best practices or methods for reestablishing expectations. And he's asking specifically to someone that's in a leadership role and is, you know, their direct report. Hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take this. I, I think we should keep this. I think you just need to sit them down and have a clear and concise conversation about it. I think you shouldn't waffle around it. You should set up an appropriate time where you clearly set up a calendar invite with them. You sit down and you say, hey, I feel like the expectations have shifted or I feel like there's a something off in this area. This is what the expectation is. Are you on board with this moving forward? And just get the green light from them. Or maybe they're not. But I think that just 
setting a formal expectation and formal sit down and clearly communicating how you feel is the best way to do it. And trying to, you know, kind of beat around the bush or, or make it anything but that, I think ultimately you'll just create resentment over time. So just right into it. Yeah. And as a manager, I can speak from, from experience that one thing I've struggled with is, you know, there's clearly a deviation in the expectations that you want to communicate and, you know, kind of painting over it with rose colors and trying to make it seem like, oh, it's not that big a deal when it is, you know, will definitely come back to bite you in the butt. So I think that's a really good point, Jay. If you're um, going to change the job for the person, you have to change the job description and have mm. them sign the new document. It that's doesn't right. matter if you just talk to them about, oh, well, now the expectations are different. That's great. Yes, we're going to talk about this, but hey, this is clearly written down on paper. This is the new path going forward. Autograph, go forward. In writing, for sure. Um, this is a good question about how to manage two questions, two coaches. One is part time, one is full time. That have two completely different visions on how the programming and culture should be. This could potentially lead to toxic, uh, you know, staff environment. He does say that, or he or she does say that both are an assets to the business. How would you, how would you handle that, Jay or MDB? I, I, I would say which one aligns with your vision and you know, are which, so if they have two different perspectives, well, which one is right? It's ultimately the one that you align with. Meaning like if one wants to do, I don't know, all body weight workouts all the time, and one wants to lift heavy all the time, where do you sit? And is there a middle ground? And if not, I would say that identify where you sit on the subjects that you're maybe having a difference of opinions on between those two, and then discuss with the one that you disagree with, if they're willing to you know, be on board with this vision. And if not, ultimately it will become toxic. If one person really believes that your gym should be doing competitor programming every single day and the other, and your vision is you want to make it more general fitness, more strength conditioning or vice versa. Eventually, if you have a difference of opinion, it will start to shine to the members because they're going to hear it's going to be undermining. So you want to make sure where do you sit on it? How do you communicate that? And then ultimately, if you have a difference of opinion, you might need to part ways or find some type of middle ground. Where do we fall on in terms of, and I'm assuming that what Manuel is asking here is, a, you know, open gym. Um, you know, what do we think about having open gym hours? I know that some people even do 24 seven access to open gym. And his follow-up question there is how do you control the, the, the training that clients are doing? Go ahead, MDB. Uh, we got to go back to the last question really quickly. Because go ahead. It doesn't matter what the coach's vision for what the programming should be within your gym. It doesn't fucking matter at all. It has to be what your vision is for, you're the business owner. You're the person who's responsible. Ultimately, it's your name on the lease. It's not the coach's name on the lease. So you have to set it. And this is what Jason said. You have to set it and they have to follow it. That's what matters most. It doesn't matter what their vision is for how the programming should be. It has to be your vision. You want them to share in that. You want them to buy into that. But Jason's spot on. If somebody's going to buck the trend, you, you have to remedy that super, super quick. I'm sorry. Uh, what was the, the more recent question? It was just thoughts on open gym and how do you control the training of clients within that model? It can be done a number of different ways. There's, there's gyms out there who run open gym 24 hours a day. There's gyms out there that don't run open gym at all. Uh, we run open gym if we have space that is not being occupied in class for classes during uh, operation hours. We don't have non-operation hours open gym. And the expectation is that when athletes come on in and participate in open gym, they sign up for the open gym session. They do whatever workout or whatever thing that needs to be done there. It's staffed by a staff member or a front desk member and that they are participating in fitness in a relatively safe manner and they clean up their stuff after they're done. Hector has a question about coaching evaluations, um, specifically for a veteran coach that's been doing it for three plus years. Um, MBB, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that we have in the past done our PADRs um, or coaches evaluations twice or three times a year. And I don't think that that necessarily changes based on how experienced the coach is, correct? No, everybody gets evaluated at the same time time and cadence as everybody else. And this idea that veteran coaches don't need to be evaluated or given feedback is nonsense. 
that would show me that that person has a more amateur mindset than anything else. If they're not open to feedback about their coaching. Um, so everybody gets evaluated. Everybody should be open to feedback. The things that you might look for in a more experienced coach are going to be very different than the things you might look for in a more beginner coach, but everybody gets evaluated. Steve has a question about, you know, if we a B test things that we introduce to the business gym, um, offerings, products, process, you know, technology like Slack. And if so, for how long, um, you know, I, I don't think that we necessarily a B test everything and that, you know, we didn't have a part of the team that used Slack and a part of the team that didn't, or a part of, you know, the gyms that have a certain program or don't, but we are constantly testing and trying to improve the things that we do in that, you know, we'll roll something out. And if it's clearly not working, we always like to revisit it at kind of that 30 and 60 day mark. I think it's actually really good practice because even if something works really well for another business, another team, or you've heard it works really well, it might not work well for you. So it is good to kind of reassess after that 30, 60 timeframe and, and kind of see where you're going moving forward. Um, and then we're coming up on our last two questions. So, Mitchell asks, um, Jason, you mentioned being scared or nervous when making a big step for a big hire. A hundred percent agrees. You know, what steps do you take when evaluating if a decision is right? Um, uncertainty, insecure, essentially what steps do you take to create clarity in your decisions? Yeah. So Mitchell, um, Good question. Not sure why you're using Ashley's uh, account, but yeah, Mitchell, uh, good question. And I would say that, you know, over the years, we've made some large investments in people and we've made large investments in spaces. And if I could advise myself, I would say that when the situation has turned out the best, it's the times when I took our time the most but knew that it was the right decision. I just didn't know if we could afford it. So I, I don't know how to answer this without saying that every single time we made a major investment in a people, it was because I hit my breaking point and I could no longer do it anymore. I was so freaked out, so overwhelmed, so just whatever that I had to get help. Those were like the major, major hurdles, right? And if you've gone through that in your business, you know what I'm talking about. You're staying up at night thinking about your finances. That's probably a good time to hire someone to help you. Or you know you need to get growth, but you don't have any more time in the day. Maybe you need to help somebody with sales or, or whatever, whatever these examples are. And then when you're taking on um, new locations or whatever, you should sit back and reflect on your core value of what am I trying to do as a business? So if you're sitting there and you're freaked out, you got to ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish as an owner? Do you need another location? And if so, why do you need another location? Does it align with your mission, your vision? As, as Because taking on more takes on more risk and responsibility, but also benefits more. And so I think just to kind of like close the loop on this, when you're really freaked out and you're hitting your at wall, it's probably a great time to make the decision. That decision has probably been months in the making and you're probably ready to make it. And for those of you listening who are in that decision, I think you know what I'm talking about. And then if you go take on additional risk, like new locations, hire new people, you got to recognize like, this is what you chose. You chose this journey as an owner. You chose to sign this lease. And so make sure that you're making that decision with a clear, con conservative mind. And once you make it, be all in on it. Love that. Coming up on our last question, really appreciate the, the 30 attendees that have, that have stick, stuck it with us here. Um, so how do you handle it when a full-time loses motivation because they're starting to get frustrated that the part-time coaches aren't showing the same effort um, for work for the gym as the full-time staff? And then I think the second part of the question I'm going to try and just kind of break it down is, is then how do you, you know, make sure that then the coaches that are frustrated aren't kind of passing down that frustration to the members? Well, I think, some of this comes back to having really clear expectations for what the, the job is and what the culture is at your gym and the staff members understanding that. So, you know, there will necessarily be a little bit of a difference between what a full-time person can participate in and do and what a part-time person can participate and should participate and, and do as well. And I also think recognizing that is important. If you have misaligned expectations, 
you're going to be frustrated, right? Like if you're expecting that a part-time staff member is going to stay after for an hour after their class is done to do everything that needs to be done to get the gym back in, in shape. Well, unless that that's the clearly defined expectation, unless they're being paid for that, then no, there's probably no way in the world that they're going to be doing that. So I, I think you have to take a hard look in the mirror and look and go, Hey, have I set up the right systems and process here to make sure that my staff members understand and clearly know their roles and responsibilities and their expectations? And do they know what the entire staff is responsible for? That would be my first look there. Um, and then also just have, giving the front, the full-time people, the understanding that, yeah, like, Hey, you are a bit more committed here. That's part and parcel of the role. And you can guide these people along a better path versus getting frustrated with them. You can also guide them and help them see that there might be a better way to do things. Um, that's just my opinion on it. No, I think that's a great answer, MDV. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we went over a little bit, but I'm super fired up that we got so many questions towards the tail end of that one. I think that, you know, it goes to show that this was a, an important discussion and, and a lot to unpack here. MBB, Jason, thank you guys again. Thank you everyone that joined us and everyone that watches this recording later on. Excited for whatever we're gonna bring on the webinar next month. Jason, do you wanna close us off with anything? Yeah. I just wanna close off with this. Uh, Stephanie says that they've been burned by the last two hires. They, they did everything right. Everything was right, but then both of them left without a two week notice and just dropped off. I don't know enough about the situation to make a clear assumption here. But what I will say is if you're a business owner and you think you're doing everything right, but then there's multiple situations where maybe sometimes you have to look within and say, is there something we're doing wrong at our business to cause this? Because a lot of the times, if you have members that are leaving or whatever, you want to deflect and say it has something to do with something else. But sometimes you need to take a hard look at you and say, well, do, is it our responsibility that these two coaches back to back both left without a two week warning. So I just wanted to share that with, with all the owners out there, take a hard look sometimes. Cause if you see repeated situations, it might not be them. It might be you. And also for anybody listening, if you haven't checked out the NC fit collective, it's the world's best session plans and programming. Make sure to check it out. It's done by all of us here at NC fit. And we're proud part of it. And thank you for joining us on the webinar today. Awesome. Thank you guys.